you just read the sun content page, make sure you're jotting down these new terms for the layers of the sun. What I want to talk to you about right now in this little lecture video is the 11 year solar cycle. Okay. If you want a more in-depth analysis of the sun, then you can take astronomy with Mr. Atkinson, uh, sophomore, junior, senior year. But here we're just going to do a general overview. The sun now is, it's huge. All right. It's definitely not the biggest star. The sun is a star. It's our star in our solar system. We call it the sun. It is very large compared to the planets in our solar system. Here is the earth right here. 1.3 million earths can fit inside the sun. This is Venus. That is Mercury. It's tiny Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So the sun is huge compared to our planets. It is the source of all energy on earth. All of the energy on earth either comes directly from the sun or it comes from some secondary process that results from the energy of the sun. Now, some people think that it's a huge fireball. It is not. It is a huge, glowing, hot plasma ball of gas. All right. So remember from before, in space, after the Big Bang, there was just a ton of hydrogen. Trace amounts of other stuff, hydrogen and helium, but there's just a bunch of hydrogen gas floating around. Eventually, the gravity of those hydrogens made big clumps. You can think of like big clouds of hydrogen. It's not a star yet, but it's like a pre-star, proto-star. Once the clumps or the clouds of hydrogen get large enough, they start to do something called nuclear fusion. Now that is when the cloud of hydrogen gets so big that the gravity gets so strong that it actually smashes hydrogens together in a process called nuclear fusion. It's a reaction where two atomic nuclei, in this case hydrogen, the gravity smashes them, smashes them together and combines them to form a brand new element. So if you have one hydrogen, which has an atomic number one, and another hydrogen, atomic number one, smash them together, the new atom will have an atomic number of two in general. That's a quick overview. And you will make helium. That process, nuclear fusion, it makes, it releases a ton of radiation. It requires a whole lot of energy, and some of that energy is released as radiation. So the sun is a huge hot ball of fusion reactions that is emitting radiation out into space, and we feel it from Earth. We feel it as heat, as UV, all kinds of uh, wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's talk about the 11-year solar cycle. So the sun goes through an 11-year cycle where the north and south poles flip. So here, at the minimum, let's say the North Pole is north, like our Earth. By the end, after 11 years, the North Pole will then actually be flipped. It'll be on the opposite side of the Sun. Now, this is important because over that 11-year period, when the magnetic field flips, sunspots start to pop up. As you can see, here's what we call solar minimum. There's very few sunspots. Halfway through the cycle, the sunspots get much more abundant. Then they go back down at the end of the cycle once the magnetic field flips. So this is important because the activity on the sun's surface changes throughout the cycle as the number of sunspots increases. Right? The sunspots are actually placed on the sun that has a much stronger magnetic field. So here's an image of the sun during a maximum in the middle of the cycle and at the end. You can see all this activity. It's much different. Now, these sunspots are important because they can lead to coronal mass ejections and solar flares. Now, a solar flare is when the sun kind of blasts out, bursts out radiation, some electromagnetic radiation. And coronal mass ejections are sort of the same thing, except actual chunks of plasma from the corona get blasted out. And those have their own magnetic field. So it's... A coronal mass ejection is like a solar flare, except actual sun stuff shoots out too, which can have, it can have an effect on us on Earth. Uh, I know that we all love Wi-Fi. You know, the uh, what's the symbol for Wi-Fi? I think it's like this. Uh, all of the electronic stuff that we have can be damaged by magnetic radiation. So coronal mass ejections and solar flares can actually damage our power grids. It can destroy computer chips, it can destroy wiring, uh, electronic stuff can get messed up by this. If a coronal mass ejection is huge enough, 
it could damage human life, but we haven't really seen many that are that big that shoot huge balls of plasma onto the earth. Um, but they do, they can minorly affect the climate. We'll talk about that later. The cool thing though, is that generally solar flares and coronal mass ejections that happen, the earth has its own magnetic field. And when those magnetic energy bursts hit the earth, we actually get a really beautiful thing that's called the Aurora Borealis. The green you see, it's real. That's what you'd see if you're there. That is the Earth's magnetic field blocking the bursts that come out from the sun. Pretty cool, huh? The last thing I want to mention very quickly is just our sun, its life cycle. It starts as a nebula. You should have that in your notes, what a nebula is. And once the gases in the nebula get abundant enough, the gravity pulls all the gas together, it starts fusion, then it is officially a star. What we call our sun is a star. And that's in main sequence. It's smashing hydrogens together, making helium. Eventually it starts to run out of fuel and it swells up. And then it can make some more elements like carbon and oxygen until eventually it just loses its gravity. It runs out of fuel and those elements kind of drift off into space and just the core is left. And once those elements all puff off, Come out into space, a white dwarf is left behind to cool for a long, long time. 